All right, so I started, like Johan said, I wanted to sort of start simple and then I'll build up in complexity. So the first few slides are, are very straightforward and possibly insultingly so, but um, I really want to set context for what we're trying to do and why. And so just sometimes it, it's good to repeat things, even if they're, if they're fairly obvious. So the DOE labs have for decades hosted the, the world's largest supercomputers. Um, this is something that is a key driver for us. Um, we, we are, I would argue, have been pushing the boundaries of supercomputing for the last several decades. I have a screenshot of the top 500 list, uh, the most recent one. We have three of the top six slots, including the top slot. Um, so this is, you know, this is, this is what we do. This is something we, we very much care about. And I'm just showing pictures of not the, too fa not the fastest. Frontier is still being stood up at this point. Um, but uh, the thing is, this is changing. Like the rest of the world is getting much more interested in supercomputing and supercomputing is getting much harder. So I wanna talk through where supercomputing is going, what we're seeing right now, and what you as scientists and mathematicians should sort of have in your brains as you think of clever ways to use these machines to do fantastic things. All right, so this is my really basic slide. Um, just basically the idea of why are we going through the trouble of parallel computing, especially as what I'm going to tell you is parallel computing is getting very hard. Why, why is it worth it? Why not just stick with our laptops? And it's surely the scale. So the fact I, I did a little, uh, this is from last year, I did a diff of the most expensive uh, MacBook Pro I could find on Apple's website with everything maxed out and Summit, which was our fastest supercomputer at the time. And the, the, the numbers here are really tell you the story, that 87,000 times more memory and millions of times more compute power. So with this difference, you can do science you otherwise could not do, and that's why we do it. All right, and here's, again, possibly the most obvious slide in the world, but I give, I give these sorts of talks to audiences I'm trying to entice into the supercomputing world, and something that I find people don't fully appreciate is what memory is, really means to us. And I suspect you all know this, but it's not speed. When you buy a laptop for yourself or for your mom, you just make sure there's enough RAM that Windows won't lock up or be really laggy. Um, you don't really care about it beyond that. It's just enough. Whereas for us, it is purely, you know, how many objects can we stuff in there to do science? How much can a GPU, how much science can a GPU hold? And so what I walk through is, I take a very simple example. You have a carbon atom and you wanna know, using MD or Monte Carlo, where it is and where it's going. Um, that's 52 bytes of information. If I bought the fastest uh, AMD GPU I could buy, that corresponds to 128 gigabytes of memory, which again, we, what we care about here is how many atoms can I stick in there? Or if I'm doing circulatory modeling, which is a, a side project I dabble in, how many red blood cells can you stick on that? Or how much, you know, what square, mileage of seismic model can you fit on that? So that's what memory means to us, and managing memory has become a real occupation for people who want to do supercomputing. So it's really important to have enough memory, but also know how to manage it. All right, so with this memory, you can now do a big simulation. This is something that Tim has touched on in his talk, and I'm gonna sort of reemphasize this same story because back in 2005, we were starting to build much bigger computers than we'd ever built before. This is, a, a, I'm gonna show a simulation from the Blue Gene L machine. And the big argument for making this big leap in, in scale was that there were systems that we weren't sure we were simulating accurately enough because you couldn't run a bigger one. We'd filled the system, we'd run the simulation, and we're like, well, maybe that's right, but the only way to really be sure is to run a bigger simulation. So what I'm gonna show is a, is a movie that was made back in 2005, this is old news now, but to really illustrate the importance of scale in material simulation. And so this is, they were doing a simulation of compressing, uh, let's see, it was, you take liquid tantalum and you compress it so it solidifies and it creates these different grain boundaries, grains and domains. And the color here is liquid order, solid order, or a glassy in between state. And so what you'll see is as we zoom out, and we're gonna zoom out, this is gonna be a much bigger simulation, but you're gonna see the size of these structures is going to be about the box size until you get far enough out that no longer is the domain size influencing the dynamics. So we're just going on factors of 10. It's a very different simulation you see with 20,000 atom domains. We zoom out again to 200,000. And you, again, you're still seeing continents though, they're about the size of the box. And so two million, Again, things are looking good, but now it's only when you truly get out to 20 million that you're like, well, no, actually, now those domains are the size that they are. And this is, in fact, 
we think, a realistic simulation to do. And so this is just, you know, the movie's finishing out to show you this is just a slice through a three-dimensional simulation and that we didn't just cherry pick the one that actually looked reasonable. It all basically looks about the same. And so this gave confidence that with this new capability, they could simulate materials at a scale they otherwise could not and actually be confident they were, they were not having issues with the fact that they, can, they only had, you know, 2 million atoms or, or 200,000 atoms. All right, so that's just the basic takeaway is you just, if you want to be sure it's big enough, you just run bigger and bigger and bigger until it looks the same, basically, and then you can take one step back and save yourself the time. All right, well, I think this is my last super obvious slide, which is we do parallel computing, and this is really the, the argument most people have had most of their lives for parallel computing is strong scale your way so that you get an answer faster. And if we were truly able to strong scale from a laptop to full summit, it is an astonishing difference. One hour of work on full summit is basically 736 years on the best MacBook you could buy last year. So obviously that is compelling. And so an example I want to give for this was another project I worked on at Livermore back in 2012. And this, we just got our Blue Gene Q machine, Sequoia, and they wanted to do something, because this is an IBM system, and IBM and Livermore were talking about what can we do that would really show how cool it is to have a giant supercomputer. This was basically back when IBM was building Watson, and they had just had a real bent for PR at the time. And luckily, they also had researchers working at IBM who had some experience in trying to understand the effects of cardiotoxicity on drugs. They were cardiac researchers, um, and this was a big problem, that often you would develop a new drug, you'd give it to people, I mean, not for heart problems, but it'd be for cancer or for something else, and then people would start having heart attacks at a much higher rate than they should and die and, die and dying. And so the little pie chart there is just a study that was done of why were things being recalled, and almost half of them were being recalled for cardiotoxic effects. Because ultimately, the way your heart works electrically is there's these ion channels that get, can get perturbed by any number of things, and drugs is a big one. And if you change that behavior, it's mostly fine. But in some people, not always so fine. And so developed researchers had models for this. The problem is they had to basically run on like little hamster hearts for like, you know, a fraction of a, of a heartbeat because it just was very computationally expensive. This is not a useful tool. You need to be able to take a drug or five candidate drugs, run them for days or hours or months of, of real, you know, heart beating time to see what the effects are on how the heart will actually function under those conditions. So this is a case where if we could actually really truly strong scale this problem, we could actually change this tool, make it something that's not really very useful to something that actually is quite useful. And in fact, the funny thing is all the, the, at Livermore, all they conscripted were uh, people doing things like molecular dynamics, because Livermore is not a cardio, cardiology lab, we are a physics lab for the most part. Um, and we had spent a lot of time figuring out how to make things like MD run well on a big supercomputer. It turns out a lot of those lessons transfer very naturally over to this type of application. And so it worked out very well. Um, we used our expertise. They, had, they brought in the hard expertise. And ultimately, we were able to get not quite real time, which really was crushing because we were desperate to get real time. But an hour of heartbeats we could do in an hour and seven minutes, which is still pretty good. And so here's a picture of an arrhythmia that came out of that project. Um, and the thing to take away is this is why you couldn't do this with a hamster model because the effect of this, it's a high resolution simulation and the mechanics are really based, they, I mean, this, the patterns, the flow that is happening is happening across the entire heart and it varies with the structure of the individual specific heart model that was used. So you really have, if you want to understand the, the, what's happening when people get arrhythmias, you really have to have something that's a real human and not a small toy model. So again, that was, that was very gratifying. It, it felt like you, we, we did something that could actually maybe help people, which is always nice. And ultimately, it really is a good example of you know, strong scaling, really changing what you can do with, with your scientific simulation. All right. I think this, this story has been told already, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell it again to be a little bit more dramatic about it, maybe. This is sort of a, a quick two-slide history of HPC. Uh, we had a, a long way, a period where we had vector machines, big special purpose supercomputers. And then we hit the 90s and it turned out people were buying regular personal computers and if you just chained them together, it was much more cost effective to make a computer that used distributed memory and had a bunch of off-the-shelf pieces all hooked together with a nice fast network. And um, 
it was honestly, it turned out the golden age of HPC. We didn't know it at the time. But this distributed memory error lasted from tens to hundreds of cores in the 90s up to a million cores in the 2010s. And the thing that really distinguished it in retrospect was the fact that your code was your code. If you, if you did a smart job of breaking it up across MPI tasks, you may have some twiddling and fiddling to, to make it run well on a different network or you know, with different CPUs that might have special instructions, but it still ran and it generally ran pretty well. And so you just wrote one code and it just worked. We are now in the heterogeneous era and that, everything I just said is no longer true really pretty much at all. So now we have CPUs and GPUs. The thing that we're seeing is we don't see a path forward to continue to have everything speed up without greater and greater specialization because we're hitting limits of fundamental physics and material science. Also power has become our real critical bottleneck and that's a hard thing to, to do much better than we're already doing it without throwing things overboard. And so this is why we're going to things like GPUs because we've long had a reason to make those specialized because they're not trying to solve every problem. They're trying to figure out how to make pixels on a screen or triangles of rendered people blowing up in Call of Duty look cool and go fast. So this is the reality we're in. Um, key things, and I think this has probably already been talked about, is that compute has gone so much beyond all the other parts of an HPC system that the, the lessons we used to use of don't do redundant calculations. Be really smart about breaking this up so you don't calculate the same thing twice is on its, it's been turned on its head. Compute is basically free. Recompute anything you want. It's totally fine. Don't move data. Don't waste memory. Those are, those are now the, uh, the real driving factors. Also, the complexity of a heterogeneous system is much more difficult to, to deal with. You have separate memory spaces. You have NUMA issues. You can, it's very hard to have a code that just is very smart and sensible and can run on any one of these types of configurations without accidentally doing something silly. It's certainly much harder than it was in the last, last era. We also now have the challenges of if you want it to be portable, how much performance do you have to sacrifice to do that? I mean, portability is kind of the goal, but we also really would like to have a nice turnaround in our science. And then the final store thing is we are going, we are in the process of, and we'll probably have to continue refactoring all these existing codes that were developed during the distributed memory era for the heterogeneous era. We, it's a lot of work, and this is what the Exascale Computing Project has been struggling, working on the last six, seven years. What we really don't want to do is have to do this again in 10 years. So we need to start thinking longer term, what lessons, what patterns are we seeing, and what trends are we seeing, and how can we sort of future-proof things for ourselves for that. And so just to sort of show some specifics as to what I meant in terms of these eras, um, the end of the distributed memory era, I would say, is probably in, in here. We have our blue gene machines, but even then, the GPUs are creeping in. As we got to this point, all we had are GPUs, which, again, for some people was, was devastating. Was, you could ignore them up until the point that there was nothing, nothing but. But what really got us kind of worried and excited is the fact that as we moved into Exascale, we have three different flavors of GPUs. You can't even just write everything in CUDA. If you write things in CUDA, they don't run on the two sort of flagship Exascale machines. You now have three different types, and we don't know that's going to end. Who knows what's going to be around the corner? But some type of accelerator and some type of CPU is what we have now. We don't know what, what we're going to have next. And I just figured I would grab um, some more details on the two Exascale machines that we are currently working on. Frontier is being stood up as we speak. It is actually, it works. People in this room have run on it. Um, they measured 1.1 exaflops in double precision back in uh, May. I think it's probably even doing better than that now. Um, and yeah, there's a, there's a lot of statistics. I pulled this all off the website. So if you want to see kind of their fun, how many gallons of water do they use to cool and how many calculations per second can it do, it's, uh, it's kind of fun to see that. The thing I wanted to really call out here is that um, one CPU, four GPUs, about 10,000 nodes. These are the scales that we're dealing with. Um, yeah, I think that's, oh, and then, and then about five petabytes of memory. Memory has not gone up in leaps and bounds in the last decade. I think, I remember what uh, Blue Jones Sequoia had, was it like two petabytes? Um, but it was not, <laughs> we're not getting tens or hundreds of times more memory. It really is, it's much harder to get memory now. And then the other exascale machine is um, being cited at Argon. It's Aurora. This is an Intel GPU-based machine. Um, Intel CPUs as well, because Intel's building it. 
Here we have six GPUs for two, and two CPUs per node, um, also about 10,000 nodes. So those are the scales that people have to figure out how to write codes to run on. In terms of trends, we really think what we're seeing is just the beginning of specialization. So CPUs, multipurpose, we're always going to need some sort of CPU on the system. Um, GPUs are specialized. We've had this for a while. We are now seeing a fair amount of AI accelerators. And this is actually worth taking a moment to stop and point something out, which is the fact that we spend all this money on supercomputers um, <laughs> does not make us any real driver for the market because video games made infinitely more money than any, than any of these companies will ever make from DOE. Ditto AIML. Their, their customers are throwing money at this that we can, even, can, can only dream of. They're the ones who are going to drive what's in these chips and what they can do and what the real critical workloads are. We have to figure out how to use them. And so we think as the specialization continues, the hope is there will be ways of specializing chips that we can piggyback on and develop custom accelerators for very specific science workloads. But again, we have to kind of wait and see what happens with that. And then the thing that everyone's very excited about, I'm personally a little skeptical about, is quantum. I mean, we're going to get there. I just don't know when. And I think it's going to be longer than we think. But it would be fantastic if all the momentum we've had really led to something functional in the next 10 years or so. All right. OK. So why is heterogeneous computing hard? It's really actually, uh, Johannes kind of spoke to this already, which is, I mean, it actually came out really nicely in the Slurm presentation, which is, oh, please. Yeah, just one question. I guess you mentioned the Apple computer at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, Apple has this interesting system on the chip, right? So like the, the M1 generation. Right. Do we see this coming to, to HPC systems as well? Do we see ARM coming? Maybe you can. I will, I will speak to ARM. Um, I can't speak to Apple's. I mean, I think Apple is really essentially ARM-ish, isn't it? I mean, and I will, I will speak to that in a, in a bit. Um, unfortunately, even that doesn't really save us because in place of these specialized accelerators, they have very wide SIMD units that are probably even harder to use, I would argue, than, than GPUs. So even though you don't have two separate programming models, you still have this situation where you have to find a way to line up, line up your calculation to fit into these massive vectors that is not easy to do at all. All right, so when we talked about Slurm, it came up that, well, if I want to, even if I just want to run on CPUs, how do I make sure I bind this so that I'm using the memory spaces I think? If I want to run CPUs and GPUs, I have to make sure that they're in the right, you know, I'm, I'm attaching my MPI tasks to the socket that, that the GPU belongs to. And we have distinct memory spaces down here. So, you know, DDR is up here. Each GPU has its own memory. Um, you need to fit thing, all, the, all the work, all the data for the work you want to do at the right place, and then you have to move it around. That, that's unavoidable. And managing this gets tricky. One thing that's interesting is when we got Sierra, um, the, the class of the NSA version of Summit, it had hardware unified memory, which some of our code teams were like, great, if I need the memory, if I need, if I need to touch data, and I haven't moved it from the CPU to the GPU, it'll just do it for me. Turns out it will, um, but there's some unintended consequences. One of the teams had a massive performance problem. They did all the porting work. They thought it was going to run great, and it was like 10 times too slow. And they, the, the performance profiling tools were kind of immature at the time, so they were really just going in circles. And then they finally got a good tool that would show them what was happening. It was data motion up the yin-yang. And what happened was they had some object that had in it a member variable, it was just like a handy parameter, and, and some piece of code in one routine was just grabbing it. It's like, oh, let's just make sure that we haven't exceeded the box size or whatever the parameter was. And then somewhere later in a GPU kernel, it needed it as you know, something to be multiplied by. And so what they were doing is paging this page that had this variable in it back and forth and back and forth over and over and over, and it took up over half the runtime, which is astonishing for how it was eight bytes or something. But it just goes to show that if you don't manage this, if you just sort of let things happen, Terrible things can happen. It's very hard to do things performantly by accident. So you really have to kind of stay on top of it and know what's going on. Um, and then for heterogeneous computing now, if you write your code for Summit, how do you make it run on Frontier and Aurora? So each of these have a different programming model. CUDA doesn't work on Aurora or Frontier, and their programming models don't really work anywhere else either. Sickle, they tried to make it very portable, but it's not been picked up. And then why is using an accelerator is hard? And this is where I want to talk about ARM. 
because we're in this specialized era, we need to find ways to get more compute out of the same amount of power, there's really no free lunch. So GPUs use SIMT, where you want to line up all these, all these instructions, you know, run them on this massive, you know, wide, large numbers of threads, get warps all going. Um, so the idea is GPU accelerator architecture is really designed around the assumption of these massively concurrent workloads. If you don't have that, it's hard to use a GPU well. The problem is, um, so do CPUs now. So every CPU that I'm aware of uses vector instructions in some capacity to, to achieve the stated performance. If you hear about a, you know, 10, 100 gigaflop uh, CPU, it's because they're able to execute all these instructions as vectors. And so I just put a little picture of what a SIMD operation is if you're, if you're not aware or if you didn't remember. Um, but the tricky thing about SIMD compared to SIMT is SIMD is all or nothing. If, it, if the compiler cannot find the right number of instructions to fill a full SIMD operation, it punts. It just doesn't, and then there may be exceptions where some compilers are smart enough to pad it out with nonsense and do most of them. But you know, in my experience, most of our most vectorization in the compiler is very limited, and it's very hard to get really reliable vectorization, especially with multiple SIMD widths. And the the latest uh, ARM in Riken, the A64FX, has 512-bit SIMD. That is 64 doubles. Um, that you have to do all at once, every time. And the thing that's kind of terrifying is, this is a 500 petaflop system. If you don't get those SIMD instructions in most of your workload, it's actually an eight petaflop system. That is you know, a massive loss of performance, but it's unavoidable because the power is the power and you know, this, is, this is just how computing is now. So it's, people are dragging their feet and resisting going to GPUs because you have to rewrite your code, but living in the CPU-only world is not much easier, and it's, it's, we're building fewer and fewer machines that are pure CPU machines. All right, I've given a bunch of slides, and I figured I would stop and ask who should care about this talk. Um, so obviously, I'm hoping for the rest of this talk to sort of talk through some of the design decisions that people writing codes are going to have to make. So if you're planning to write some code at some point in your life to run on these machines, definitely pay attention. If you have an existing code that you are going to participate in modernizing or refactoring or adding features to, you probably should also pay attention. But I also went ahead and just said anyone who's planning to run a code probably should pay attention because understanding some of the trade-offs and consequences of these current and future architectures is going to be a real game changer to using these codes well. Um, it is very easy to misuse a code on these machines if you don't think through all the ways the, the, the code is trying to use the machine and understand what's happening under the covers. It's very hard to use these things as black boxes. So the question is now, how do we avoid this happening in the future? Can we do a better job of future-proofing our codes? And in that vein, I'm going to speak to a counterexample. But first, I want to just be a little more dramatic. So um, <laughs> as we've looked down the road, um, we are really having to reevaluate a lot of things. Um, one of the things is a lot of codes are really not naturally amenable to SIMD or SIMT. And I'm going to give a few examples of this. Others may work, but they have to be very carefully tuned and run. And also, a lot of codes are built on algorithms that were designed or chosen based on assumptions that no longer hold. The biggest one being the sort of trade-offs of compute versus communication. So how do we move those codes forward without just rewriting them all from scratch? And we really have a lot of codes we don't want to just toss and start over again. There's a lot of work that went into those. So here's the example I want to speak through on that front. Um, we, we heard a great, you know, Vikram did a fantastic job this morning of, of starting to explain what density functional theory is. I still cannot believe he did it on a blackboard. That was masterful. Um, I do not have the confidence to write on a blackboard in front of an audience. But the basic, the basic takeaway is this. If we want to understand electrons and the quantum mechanical properties and the chemistry that then follows, we would ideally like to solve the many body Schrodinger equation. It's exact. The only problem is it's basically impossible because of the n factorial complexity. So we make this approximation, which is surprisingly good. That instead of every orbital fully interacting and, and having quantum um, statistics with every other orbital, 
We instead just say every orbital interacts with the density, and then we use some approximations to capture all those many body effects. So here are the equations. Um, this is my one slide to complement the uh, Blackboard talk. Again, I'm not going to get I'm not going to get into it. Just as sort of a reminder that you know we're doing the cone sham equation. In the case I'm talking about, we're going to use a plane wave basis uh, where we break up each electronic orbital into a series of plane waves. Very nice basis. Also works really well in a distributed memory machine because you have just a nice long row of numbers that you can parallelize over. So I worked on a uh, DFT code for several years uh, called QBox. Um, and so I wanted to talk through how that code used to work. So this was written really for the blue gene machines. Um, this notion of take a code, uh, take a problem, really break it up over many, many MPI tasks. So we used uh, a logical process grid. Each orbital, electronic orbital, lived on a column, and so each column process column would maybe have two, three orbitals, may have 50 orbitals, but you knew that if you want to do something that involved an electronic orbital, you did not have to talk to all the MPI processes, just the ones on that grid. The basis was consistent between, so if you want to do something that, you know, some like sum up charge over all the, all the orbitals, you could just go across a row. Really designed to minimize communication as much as possible. All right, so the operations of, these, of the self-consistent loop was a mix of data motion, FFTs, and parallel linear algebra. And so, you know, we might compute the charge density, these nice subcommunicators. Um, have to update the potentials, move things back and forth from reciprocal space, more FFTs. Um, H psi, that was uh, FFTs and local gems, pretty easy. Things got a little trickier near the end of the loop. We had to do preconditioning and update our, our wave function as we were trying to minimize to the ground state. That was a parallel gem, took all the, you know, the entire machine. Reorthogonalizing, even worse, because um, we're doing triangular solves, you know, a parallel gem followed by a Cholesky decomposition and then a triangle solve, lots of data motion all over the place. And then if we had metals, we had to do another multiplication and a eigen solve. So the problem with this is, it worked, by the way, it worked really well back then. It doesn't work well at all now. So here's a strong scaling plot on um, Blue Gene Q, CPU only machine, and strong scaling was great because easy to do. All you had to do was keep doubling the number of tasks you ran on. And just as a reminder, I mean, I'm assuming everyone here knows what strong scaling is, but that means we're running the same problem on more and more compute tours. Um, and I, at some point, you're going to have so little extra, you know, so little compute for each one to do, but more and more communication, it just becomes not worth it. So it rolls off. And so we, we got up to about a quarter million MPI tasks with very good strong scaling. And even then, we, got, we saw some improvement, which we were happy about. We went up to over a million. But it, this, this really lent itself to parallel decomposition across the distributed memory system. The problem is we built this code on libraries that I don't know, they don't, they're not going to work on GPU systems. Scalapack was a core library we used for uh, parallel linear algebra. If you look in Scalapack source code, it is a mass of little standalone routines that move data all over the place. So if you're moving from the GPU to a different CPU to a different GPU, it is gonna, you're going to spend more time doing that than any sort of calculation. The thing that's interesting with, with GPUs is the strong scaling is a very different beast there. Um, because heterogeneous architectures have a bit of a Goldilocks problem. You basically, there's a, there's a, a spot at which you overflow the GPUs. So if you want to put like one orbital per GPU or five orbitals per GPU or whatever, if the GPU memory is too small for that because maybe your plane wave basis is too big, it's, not, it's just not going to work. Or if it then, if your decomposition forced communication between GPUs, it's going to be horribly slow. When you're basically at the point where you've completely filled GPU memory, that is the sweet spot. That's where you want to live. But as you go up and up, because GPUs demand such massive concurrency, performance falls off much faster. And in fact, can turn over, it can get much worse. So you no longer really live in the world where you just take a problem, you know, and just run it on as many cores as you can to try and get the fastest runtime you can, because it's just not a good way to use the hardware. Instead, we really need to start thinking of, figure out the problem you have, and then fit the hardware to that. So if you have a specific vast calculation you want to run, the orbital size might tell you that, okay, this is really a four GPU problem or a six GPU problem, but you don't just sort of throw the problem in the machine and run bigger and bigger and see what happens. It's just not going to work well. 
But you have to use GPU as well. Um, this was mentioned in an earlier talk that uh, the fraction of flops on the CPUs versus GPUs, I mean, these are the, the last three machines at Oak Ridge, Titan, Summit, and now Frontier. Even back in the Titan days, 95% of the compute was on the GPUs. It's the, uh, <laughs> actually I'm surprised it's uh, this small, that you know, we went out 4% on, on the CPUs and now it's around 2% of the computers on the CPUs. And these are beefy CPUs, but unfortunately the way the machine works is just you have to run, use the GPU as well and you have to get all your, all your workload onto there. So it's, it's just changed the game in terms of how we think about writing codes and, and using them on HPC. Okay, so because of all this, um, we saw this coming. DOE started the Exascale Computing Initiative back in 2015. Um, they realized that we can't just buy bigger and bigger computers and hope people are gonna figure out how to use them. We need to have a concerted effort to sort of solve some of the challenges associated with heterogeneous computing and GPU computing and architectures like I described. So they put together this massive effort one of the components of it, so part of it was buying exascale machines, Frontier and Aurora, but part of it was developing software and applications to use those machines, and that's what ECP is. There are not any actual computers in ECP. Um, we're, we obviously have computers we're supposed to learn how to use, but this is funding scientists and computer scientists and researchers from all across the DOE complex. Um, nearly all of our 17 labs have people in DOE and it's organized into these multiple thrusts, really trying to tackle this problem systematically and not just for you know, one or two sort of cherry-picked applications. It's a fairly big project, um, 81 distinct research teams, about 1,000 researchers total, so by far the biggest project I've worked on. And the notion here is it's really broken into these three key thrusts. So uh, as Danny mentioned, I work on um, application development I'll talk about that in more detail in another slide. But we have these other pillars that I would argue are equally important, which is software technology. Um, from when I started writing code for, for computing, I was, I was a phys I'm a physicist by training and was surrounded by other physicists, and the physicist philosophy is just do everything yourself. You, uh, you're smart, you can figure it out. Don't do that, <laughs> that's a horrible idea. The, the complexity has gotten so high what you need to do is use high quality software for the right types, pieces of your problem and pick things that are designed to work well and the machines are gonna use. And that's what the software technology pillar is all about. And then because we have these machines and the vendors that are supplying them, we need people who can help us deal with the specific issues that are going to arise and that's what the hardware and integration thrust is for. It also included uh, some forward looking research on, on architectures uh, called Path Forward. So the application development portfolio, um, there's 24 applications in here, also six co-design centers led by Tim, our earlier speaker. So the idea is we want to get a broad portfolio of applications that DOE cares about, not just because we want to get these things onto the GPUs and beyond, although we do, but also to create sort of a nice overall pattern of, you know, of diversity of patterns, compute patterns, data patterns, so we could really understand what's needed in general for all efforts to run on these systems. Um, so, you know, there's really, I'm not gonna try and read all of these, but it's not just, I mean, we have materials and, and uh, chemistry in there, but we also have things like, you know, climate, wind modeling, earthquake modeling, fusion reactors, um, cancer research, it's, it's, a, it's a nice diverse portfolio. So the details, um, we started with uh, 62 codes, uh, about 10 million lines of code. So this is not a project where we told people, go write some new codes. We really had codes that existed. We had to figure out how to make them run on these new machines. Most of the code started as either MPI or MPI with OpenMP. And I'll talk about OpenMP in a second, but I'm only specifically talking about uh, the CPU threading here. And each project is designed to have a specific exascale challenge problem that they're going to try and execute. It's not just try and make your code run well on these GPUs and we'll see what happens. It really is a very specific, well-defined goal that everyone has to try to achieve. All right. Let's see how I'm doing. Not too bad, okay. So in the second half of this talk, I really wanna walk through some of the lessons learned from this application development effort. Um, 
because I think it's very easy to have the sort of the wrong impression of what you should do if you want to make your code run well on a big supercomputer with GPUs in it. And so I think it's, there's been some really key lessons, and I think some of them are actually very inspirational for people who might be advanced in the field themselves. Um, so yeah, so we have our science goals. Those are set by the researchers we chose. But then there's a, a fair amount of algorithmic innovation that either has happened or needs to happen. At that point, porting has to take place. It's, an, it's unavoidable. But I also want to speak to integration. And this is getting back to the software that I mentioned uh, in the last slide. All right, so let's talk about algorithms. So the real thing, so this is a, this is a quote that um, Andrew Siegel, the lead of application development, uh, found. And we both really like it. So it's from Hennessy and Patterson. Um, and it's talking about the notion that we, for a long time we've been using benchmarks, the most famous being uh, LinPack, to understand how software works on different hardware and do comparisons with hardware. And so the challenge, though, they're pointing out is if you just take the same code and run it on different architectures, you're not really doing the thing you want to be doing for the environment that we're in. If back in the distributed memory era where CPUs were just changing a bit or networks were changing a bit, running the same code was good because that was a really fair comparison between those two systems. But to go from a CPU-only system to a GPU system, it's not really, it doesn't really, because the way you would solve the problem is going to now be fundamentally very different for those two systems. And you don't need to constrain yourself by trying to keep everything the same on the software side. If anything, the hardware is going to change, the software needs to change even more. So we need to really have innovation at all levels of the software in order to really truly see what these systems can do and not constrain ourselves to comparisons with the past. Okay. So I'm going to talk a bit about how you figure out what algorithm would make sense on a GPU. And I'm just going to sort of walk through some of the, the key features of using GPUs well. Um, obviously, I've mentioned that it's, we need massive concurrency. There's enormous numbers of threads in flight on a, GP, on a modern GPU. Best case is you have a code that has all the performance in some small key areas, and you can really focus on those parts of the code at the exclusion of the rest. That's not always the case. Weak scaling, much better way to think about using a GPU than strong scaling for the reasons I mentioned. High arithmetic intensity or low, low data movement or both. You do not want to be moving a lot of data onto GPUs, doing a little bit of work, moving it off, and, and repeating that. You really need to either move it there once and do a lot of work on it or leave it there. Those are, those are your best cases. Minimal branching in your code. And I'll talk, to that in, talk about that more in a minute. A high flop to byte ratio is ideal and being able to take, make use of specialized instructions. The thing about algorithmic innovation is there's not a one-size-fits-all answer to what algorithm you should use. It really is going to be domain-specific, but it is everyone in every field should be looking at their code from top to bottom as to how it works on a GPU or how it would work on a GPU, and if there's other things you could do instead. For example, one of the things I think is interesting is a lot of codes have made choices about what subgrid models, for example, you might use because you don't want to use something too expensive. But if it's expensive only on the flop side, it's probably worth it to use the best one you can as opposed to trying to save you know, a few flops here and there. Whereas models or, or methods that are going to move data all over the place should be avoided at all costs. So there's a lot of examples of this. I'm going to speak to one. Let's see if there's anything else here I want to say. Um, yeah, no, I think that's good. So, in terms of the algorithmic innovation, I think this was a this is one that came up kind of halfway through ECP that just I think is fascinating. So the pro, the target application is small modular reactor modeling. So the code is called XSMR. Actually, the project is called XSMR, and it's a coupled multi physics calculation. Um, and the goal is to do virtual experiments on these new designs that have been proposed for small modular nuclear reactors. Um, it's a very challenging system. I mean, there's lots of effort that's gone into modeling nuclear reactors, but unfortunately, these are in a new domain, so you can't just use the, the knowledge that's been built up in the past. They're much smaller, so you can't use the low-order models that have been used, um, and you need very high-fidelity fluid. The multi-physics has two primary pieces to it. The CFD part, which I'm not going to speak to, and the neutronics, which I am going to speak to, because those use Monte Carlo. 
To mention Monte Carlo has a very long and proud past. Uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo. Tim uh, showed one of the papers that did the comparison, that MD did the comparison against, but it was used in 1946. Like, basically as long as we've had computers, we've been doing Monte Carlo. Um, it's a very efficient algorithm, arguably better than MD in some ways. Um, and it was popular back when we had vector machines, and it was even more popular when we moved to distributed memory, in part because it parallelizes so well. You can break up the particles into chunks and just have each task work on them. If you need to gather statistics, you can just do simultaneous calculations, also known as embarrassingly parallelism. Um, and I've written a little uh, code here to show why it's a disaster for GPUs. So my PowerPoint code is, is very simple. We, we did our decomposition where we have now a subset of particles that live on this task. We do some work, and we come to a point where we're like, well, let's see if this particle did, did, had a collision. So you do a sampling, check it against a random number. If it does, you move down the, down the line. If not, you, you do continue on. Um, maybe it absorbs, you do the same thing. And again, we keep doing this for each particle as we do this loop. Now the problem is, there's a couple of reasons why this is a disaster for GPUs. One is, the particle, what happens to these particles is not nicely distributed. So for example, the number of collisions, this is a log scale on the, on the y-axis. Most of them have maybe 10, maybe 20, like not very many collisions, and then they're done. A very small number, and it's a long tail, have four or 500, and that is the problem. So you've set your warp up, and you know, the warp owns a bunch of particles, and it, all the particles do their thing except one guy who's just stubbornly bouncing around the system. And so all this time is spent idle because everyone's waiting on that particle to finish. It's horrible load balance. The other problem are those if statements I mentioned. Um, again, this is, I suspect, something that is pretty well known in this room, but just be clear about it. Why don't you want if statements? Because GPUs, SIMT architectures, do not handle those well. If you have different chunks of code that each particle is marching through, it, it can execute them. It's not like SIMD where it just borts and does, you know, aborts and does everything uh, sequentially but it's going to do them one at a time. So the brown ones go first, and then the green ones, and then the blue ones. And so again, all that white space is just wasted time. So it's really not a good algorithm for GPUs, but it's Monte Carlo, like we can't just not do Monte Carlo. And so what this team realized, and I don't, I'm not claiming they invented it, but they certainly realized they should use it, is to change what they think of as their parallelization strategy. You don't parallelize over particles in this type of code. You parallelize over the common code paths that you actually want to do in parallel. So they would do a calculation where they would sort of pre-sample all these things, figure out which particles are going to scatter, which particles are going to be absorbed, and then parallelize over those events. And this is, this is again, generations of GPUs ago, but they found doing a mix of better load balancing and better organizing of the calculations they were going to do, they could get up to a 10x speed up just on the exact same hardware just by rethinking how they're actually executing their code. And so what I'm showing here is a graph where we started with, this is all normalized to the first uh, version of the code, history-based. And then they started doing these optimizations where they remove things around to better match the hardware. And the four different colors are uh, an, an early GPU, the K40, on two different types of calculations, and then the P100 is also on two different types of calculations. So along the way, they figured out they also needed to change their kernel size to get better use of the hardware. Um, so they, they had to sort of remove, flatten some kernels and move things around. But again, the thing that really stands out to me is the fact that you can get more of an improvement by just working on your code than you can get by waiting for the next supercomputer. All right, so let's talk about porting. This is the unavoidable painful part. So I've already sort of hinted at some of the pro challenges. There's actually quite a bit more. Um, I encourage you to talk to people like uh, Amadeo and Danny because they've been in the trenches of this. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm watching from above and mostly horrified, but, um, but there's a lot to it. So, I mean, how you order your loops, the size of your kernels, how you, how you avoid synchronizations. I mean, managing these massive numbers of threads on this data is a very tricky business. Um, and then making sure it's well aligned with the GPU that you're running on. 
And I, ultimately, what you want to be doing along the way is identifying similar opportunities to what I described with the XSMR project, where you're finding ways that maybe the way we are writing this code doesn't make sense anymore. Maybe we should try a different way. And so different discretizations, different physical models, um, recomputing things versus storing. This is a common thing that we've seen in, in legacy codes is that there's all these lookup tables, but we don't need to use the memory. So yeah, so um, ultimately with porting, you really have to keep the hardware in mind, but you don't want to write your code for one type of hardware. So it really is a, a balance of how can I make this more flexible and adaptable for the future without boxing myself in. And this is, gets, gets to the, one of the biggest questions ECP has gotten. Every time we talk to anybody, they're like, okay, I'm gonna rewrite my code. What programming model should I use? And this, I mean, the answer is actually Cocos, but <laughs> not really. I, I'm from Livermore, I should say Raja, but most people use Cocos. Um, but it's, it is truly not as easy as the answer is, is that glib, glib response. Um, I mean, the, the most direct way to do it is if you're gonna run on one system or maybe two, you don't have too many kernels, you can just write them in the actual native programming model, CUDA, Sickle, or HIP, for, and then just you know, do it directly. It's a very easy thing then, because you have something you can hand to the vendor or the, the people who work at NERSC or, or wherever to, to help you optimize. Um, but the challenge is you are, now, you are now creating three different code paths, and maybe more, as time goes on, and you have to maintain those. You got a feature, you have to add it to the Sickle and the HIP and the CUDA, it's a disaster. Anyone who's written software knows that's probably a terrible idea. But it's an, it's an easy thing to do. The C++ abstractions, oh, I broke this, cool. Um, the C++ abstractions, I would argue, are probably the most powerful way to manage the complexity of heterogeneous hardware because you really can truly abstract what happens inside the loop body, also the way that the data is traversed through. So like you can iterate through that loop in different patterns, different chunks, you can do loop, loop reordering. Um, kernel fission, kernel fusion, they're very powerful. So Raja and Cocos are the most notorious. Um, other people are developing their own more customized abstractions for their applications. But it really is taking advantage of language features and it's unfortunately not available to Fortran or C. Just by virtue of the fact that they don't have those, those high abstraction support. Loop pragma models are very attractive, OpenMP. Um, one thing I think I need to really be clear about is OpenMP for CPUs and OpenMP for GPUs are very different animals. OpenMP for CPUs is fantastic. If you want to thread, it is a great way to, to thread very, very directly. OpenMP for GPUs is a lot trickier to use well and the support is not great. I'm gonna talk about that more in a second. But if you're a Fortran code, you don't have that many other options. CUDA, CUDA Fortran works. There is no equivalent HIP Fortran or Sickle Fortran. And we have a lot of great codes in the world that are Fortran. So, People are gonna to have to figure out OpenMP whether they like to or not. Um, but one other thing I wanna call out is co-design frameworks. So what we call co-design really could be argued to be libraries, but libraries that are not just, I wanna call this function and it gives me an answer, but rather a library upon which you build your code around. And so for example, adaptive mesh refinement, that informs the data structure, that informs the functions you use to, to execute your solver. Like it suffuses the entire code, so it's a very tight coupling. But the nice thing is, if you can find a co-design library that you can really naturally match your application to, they do a lot of the heavy lifting for you then. So they will have the GPU implementations, AMREX, Seed, COPA, they're, they're developing all this fantastic technology that if you can piggyback on top of, you get carried along very nicely, and, and, and a lot of that can work for things like Fortran. So I encourage people who might be looking to refactor a code to, to look into ECP's co-design libraries. Question. Since you're talking about refactoring code, um, what do you think about Julia? I like Julia. <laughs> what, what else can I tell you about it? Uh, are, you, are you asking should people rewrite their codes in Julia? Well, so, um, it's sort of a, a more open-ended question. Um, you mentioned Fortran. Yep. And I remember um, an interesting talk from someone from Oak Ridge who basically said, well, Julia and Fortran seem to be a very nice, like they did to go from Fortran to Julia was very natural for this uh, group. And I just wanted to see, uh, do you have experience, uh, like positive or negative with Julia in terms of portability and 
So I, yes, I have some experience with Julia, not in terms of writing it, but in terms of working with people who, who work on it. Um, I think Julia is fantastic in the same way I think Python is fantastic, and some to a lesser degree MATLAB. It's incredibly easy for people to get up and running and express things in a very readable way. It is very early days for Julia for HPC. It's, I, it's unclear to me, how, and also it's unclear to me how much they're going to balance the trade-offs of their main audience, I think, are people running on the laptop. I think there are, is a growing push for people to run Julia on HPC, but how much are they willing to change, throw overboard the, the beautiful expressibility and black box you know, utility of Julia to add the complexity and of all this heterogeneous computing? I don't know. So cautiously interested, but I wouldn't bet the farm on it yet. Yep. Okay, so just to give a sense, we have, I mentioned we have these 62 codes. Um, we just went and looked what, what programming model to get, execute on the GPU are they using? And it's pretty, there's no real one answer that stands out. There's a whole histogram of the specific ones. We grouped them into four categories. Basically a third, a third, and then another third split into two. Um, the Cocos Raja programming models, I, I actually wonder if that's an old number because I feel like it's, it's gotten larger since then. But um, native was, was big early on at least. I don't know if it still is big. OpenMP, OpenACC have a strong following, I mean, relatively, given the fact that they're challenging, because I think we have Fortran codes that have no, have few other choices. Um, okay. Eric, so, yes. So do you have any uh, information on the trends? So are there some, uh, because I, I'm quite surprised that TensorFlow and Python, for instance, are, are, so, are so low here compared to... That's really, no, that's, a, that's so, that, that actually, this is, this should not be taken as anything except within the group of ECP applications we've chosen. And the reason that they're so poorly represented is almost all of our codes are old school physics codes. We have one machine learning for cancer that is basically those three, <laughs> the TensorFlow, PyTorch, and, and actually I don't remember who Legion is. Um, yeah, anyway, someone used Legion. Oh. <laughs> Uh, is there double counting here? Let's say I'm using Cocos and uh, MRX. Right. Uh, would that one on each column? No, so what we do, we, there's some subjectivity here. Um, basically, we had to decide which of the two is their sort of primary mechanism for porting, getting some code to run the GPU. If they're making direct Cocos loop calls or if they're calling MRX and the MRX under the hood is calling Cocos, we, we called it by whatever the code itself interacted with primarily. Okay, so in terms of sort of the decisions and what, good Lord, I am just ruining this thing. Um, okay, in terms of the decisions that have to be made in terms of choosing a programming model, there's a really instructive example within ECP, which is uh, QMC PAC, Quantum Monte, Car or Quantum Monte Carlo application, because they chose an interesting path. Um, they, first of all, let me just sort of remind people, if you don't know what Quantum Monte Carlo is, that actually my thesis was of different flavor of Quantum Monte Carlo, so it's near and dear to my heart. It's a fantastic application method. Um, because it's incredibly accurate, it's also incredibly expensive and a little tricky. So um, the application is mostly doing diffusion Monte Carlo. They do have some auxiliary field QMC they're using for validation. So they decided to go OpenMP offload, and I'm saying that very carefully to just differentiate it from OpenMP threading. All right, so since uh, Tim used movie quotes, I figured I'd throw one in as well, which is, um, I just want to rewatch Moneyball. That's a good movie. Um, but I, I'm embarrassed to say on rewatch when, I, when, he, when uh, the owner of the Boston Red Sox is talking about the first guy through the wall getting bloody, I thought of Paul Kent, the PI of the QMC pack project, and I realized I've probably been spending too much time on ECP because, uh, yeah, it's, he, he is the perfect example of this, which is open MP offload is a great idea. The first people getting it to work are going through some pain. So they were the first through the wall. Um, they had a working CUDA code. So they, they knew how to run on GPUs and run well on GPUs. And they decided to re-implement their code in OpenMP offload. And it did not go well at first. Um, I'm showing the final results, which are actually quite good. And I'll talk through them in a second. And the problem was, Using it is, it's a little bit of a tricky programming model because you're just decorating loops, but to make things run well in a GPU, you often need to supply information about how to move the data and you know, what to do when. 
and more specific information than really OpenMP was designed to give. Usually the runtime should do all that for you. And then the fact that the offload runtimes are still very immature. Um, NVIDIA is probably the most mature, and the results I'm giving are for NVIDIA. They're now working on AMD and Intel, and they're hitting a lot of the same issues, which is they get these things to work on sort of simplified codes, but in, when you use them in anger, you find a lot of bugs or, or edge cases that were not ever really exercised. And so you get to have the fun of figuring out what's going on, why you're getting the wrong answer, why you're getting terrible performance in very specific cases, and very incrementally you can make things better. But it is, it's a, it's a decision that you make because you want the long-term portability, and that's, that's the decision they made. Um, the thing I want to call out here is the, the, so the performance results they're now seeing, the, the, it's all normalized to their CUDA code, which is the black line. The, it goes from left to right in terms of time, essentially, versions. At first, they were getting this massive difference. It was 10 times slower. Um, and what, I'm, what the different groups are, are just different calculation sizes. So 16 atom, 32, 64, all the way up to 512. The amazing thing is 512 is actually better than CUDA for various reasons, and I think it's, it's not a, exactly apples to apples because along the way they came up with cleverer ways to handle GPU workloads. But ultimately, by the end, the red, they're not all exactly at CUDA, but they're pretty close. They, they can live with that. That is, that is a reasonable performance for that, especially if it then ultimately can run this well on two other GPU models. But, you know, you don't just, when you choose your programming model, you, you don't, you have to really know what you're in for, and the mature ones, especially the ones that have a lot of the codes already really exercised in them well, often are your better bet. But if you truly want specific features of a, of a model, then maybe sometimes you have to be the vanguard to, to make it happen. And Julia may be the next one of those. Like, if you want it to work on an HPC, maybe you're the one who's out there helping make it work on HPC. Now in trends, um, that was an interesting question because we have seen a lot of movement. Um, one of our biggest movements is Fortran to C++. Just because those abstraction layers that you can do in C++ are so attractive, there's so much support for it, vendors are not excited about Fortran. It does not make them money. Um, so you might, eventually Fortran will work on these machines, but you're not their highest priority, and it's, it's hard. I mean, you're trying to get something to work that really wasn't designed for, for that system. Um, the programming models, we've seen a lot of movement toward the C++ abstractions, generally away from either native or the loop pragmas. Co-design libraries have been very fixed. That's, that's kind of a long-term relationship. You don't break up very easily. Um, but I think these trends really tell us a lot about where new people should really look. You should look at the C++ and the Cocos Raja. All right, so last thing I want to talk about integration. People who work in HPC historically have eschewed libraries or dependencies as much as possible, in large part because I'm on a brand new unstable system. If I need three other libraries to work before I can run my code, that's just three more things to go wrong or that someone else has to fix. Better I just do everything myself. That is no longer the case because of, essentially we've gone full circle around where if you want to figure out how to use the parallel I.O. subsystem, or do really good performance analysis and you know, measurement and collection of, of statistics, you figure out how to do that well on each one of these systems is, a, is just a lot more work you now have to do. Instead, you should be using libraries by teams who've made that their job. And so ECP very carefully curated a long list of software technologies and tools that were viewed as necessary for applications and, and other teams to be able to make good progress going forward and things that we need to sustain. I'm not gonna try and talk through all of these. I'll really just point out the categories. Um, a lot of different programming models and runtimes, a lot of tools, uh, math libraries are really critical. I, a lot of, uh, I actually really have to strongly recommend if you can use math libraries, things like solvers or discretizations, you definitely should. Um, but honestly, the sort of end of the day stuff is really important as well. And we haven't really exercised this as much because Iowa is always the last thing to stand up on a, on a HPC system. Um, but viz, in situ viz and analysis, compression, these are, these are all very difficult things to do well and there's a lot of really great innovation in there. Now one thing I think is really interesting about the software technology part of ECP is they're not just content to create this sort of basket of products and throw them in the world, but they're trying to kind of help create some structure and organization to it. So there's two other pieces to the, the project that I just want to call out. 
One is what they call their SDKs, software development kits. And really what they're trying to do is make groups of software much more compatible in terms of the user expectations. What are you going to find? Can you, you know, if you want to use Trilinos for your solver and you want to switch over to Hyper, how compatible are the APIs? How easy is it going to be to make that switch? What are your expectations? Really trying to just bring these communities together and have them define some standards that they're all going to adhere to to make life easier on the users. And then finally, not only that, they're also trying to bundle these into packages that, they can, that will be installed on the leadership class facilities that will be released in groups so that if you're using a bunch of these software technologies, you don't have all these random collisions that you're going to have if you just are using them yourself and only updating them willy-nilly. So that's been, a, that's been a really valuable effort that, that's captured under the name uh, E4S, the Extreme Scale Software Stack. I wanted to do a shout out to SPAC, um, which is, if you don't know what SPAC is, follow that link because life is much easier in the HPC world in terms of building and installing software and libraries if you use SPAC. It used to be you had to do everything yourself with CMake or, or AutoConf and it was kind of painful. This really simplifies a lot of that. And so that's part of the delivery for this, this E4S, E4S ecosystem. All right, I'm gonna close with just a few examples um, just to sort of show why it's worth all this effort. Like I, I talked at the beginning about the, the size scales or the time scales you can achieve um, we've had some very impressive teams come through ECP and do some very impressive things. Uh, and this is just three of them. Actually, I'm gonna, we have a bonus fourth one. This one uh, I have mixed feelings on because I live in the Bay Area and they're constantly showing uh, earthquake simulations in my house in the red zone, which kind of bums me out. But it's really my fault for buying a house right on top of the Hayward Fault. Um, so this is a fascinating one because it's a code written by physicists, uh, mostly at Livermore, some at LBL. And it, it ran well, it had a lot of great math in it. It was a C or Fortran code, um, complex nested loops, impossible to, to read or understand. And so the thought of putting it on a GPU, they were like, oh, we haven't the faintest idea where to even start. And they really just bit the bullet, they rewrote it in C++, or took the C and moved it in C++, and adopted Raja. And that made a massive difference, because before they were at the mercy of the compilers to optimize. And as we got to more and more SIMD, um, on the CPUs, the compilers could not make heads or tails of these big, long, complicated loops. Um, it's like a fourth order finite difference code written in hand by like a genius Swede. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, the compiler's never gonna figure it out. Um, and so along the way, they also reevaluated their algorithms. They found they changed their discretization to involve curvilinear coordinates to reduce the total number of elements they needed. And from start to finish of the project, they've seen a thousand fold improvement in their computational work rate, how many you know, elements can they process per second, on machines that really sped up by a factor of 50 at most in terms of theoretical peak. And so it seems almost impossible, but it's because they were using the earlier machines very poorly, they're using the new machines very well, and they've now also reevaluated re their algorithms, so in fact they're solving the problem much more efficiently than they were before. So it's, it's really a fascinating, fascinating result. They've, because of this, they've been able to get to high enough resolutions that they can see the frequencies that shake individual buildings. Before, with a coarser mesh, you can only really see how bridges or much longer, larger structures will, will move because they only have long frequency modes. With the higher frequency modes, you can actually model you know, San Francisco in an earthquake and you can look at individual buildings and individual neighborhoods based on soil models and say that one, you know, the way we have earthquake codes right now are based on very homogeneous assumptions. You could actually use this to make buildings much safer for the area you're actually in because you're not just assuming all buildings will move the same way because it really depends on what soil they're sitting on and where they are. And I talked about the XSMR project. Um, they've also been incredibly successful. So they've now actually been able to do a full simulation of a small modular reactor core. Um, they've been able to achieve a 70x performance improvement from start to finish. They don't have quite the, <laughs> quite the thousand fold increase. I probably shouldn't have led with that one, but for a machine that is 50x more powerful to exceed the hardware capabilities is, is very impressive. And actually, I think they have a fair more headroom as they continue to optimize. So this honestly really gives 
gives us a tool that can be used to create some you know, clean energy infrastructure that's different than the old school giant Chernobyl reactors. Like this, this, could, this could really help us you know, make a cleaner, cleaner energy environment. And then this is one I think is just fascinating. Um, so this is a project called ExaWind. They're modeling not just wind turbines, but fields of wind turbines, which is a very difficult computational problem. And what I hadn't realized is that wind turbines are very difficult to cite because what comes out of a wind turbine is just garbage for every other wind turbine that comes down because it's a massive amount of turbulence. Wind turbines are meant to get nice, clean, straight wind, and then, then they, they spin very nicely. When you send a bunch of turbulence down, you get all sorts of jitter and the thing is noisier, it breaks faster, it's much less efficient. However, how do you actually know how to site a field to minimize these effects without just plopping them down and then measuring it? Like that would be very expensive, they're hard to move. So what they wanted to do is be able to model the interacting effects of wind turbines under different conditions. You could change heights of turbines, you could change the types of blades, um, but computationally it was completely intractable. They are now at the point where they can do multiple wind turbines separated by hundreds of feet and still get the high, you need very high resolution at the blade. That's why it's such an interesting problem. They're built on top of the AMR um, adaptive mesh library, AMREX. Uh, they also have their own, another code, uh, Nalu Wind, that uh, they've, they've moved along. And they don't have a performance target, they have a capability target, and we haven't hit it yet, but they are basically ready to, to now run on Frontier and try and be able to do this thing that they've never been able to do before. So that's very exciting. And then I just want to mention this one because this is our WarpX project. Um, what I'm showing here is a simulation they did um, of what's called a plasma wake field accelerator. So as you, you try and get bigger and bigger in high energy, you know, pla um, sorry, accelerator facilities for doing high energy physics, it gets very difficult because they just have to get physically bigger and bigger and they're much more expensive to build. So scientists have theorized that instead you could actually use staged plasma wake fields where you basically would build one of these things to create a plasma wave that you would then feed into the next one and augment it and it would just get more and more high energy in stages but you could build it on a much smaller scale. So it would be much smaller than Slack for example. Um, so they actually were one of our first applications to get on the frontier. Um, they were able to run on basically the full system uh, with fantastic performance, and in fact, their, their first calculations are really validating that this proposal, which no one's actually tried to build one of these, is showing, and what I'm showing here is the, the, the basic idea is you hit this, um, this kind of angled piece of material with a beam, and the hope would be that you'd get this reflected jet of plasma, electronic plasma going, going in the right, all sort of in the right direction. With the, with the right sort of density and distribution, energy distribution properties. And the early simulations seem to validate that initial proposal. So they're gonna, of course, do more. They're gonna work with the engineers. But this could be the, one of the first cases of computation being the first part of the, of the story before you start building something that you, know, you now have confidence will actually work. So that was very exciting. They won a uh, Gordon Bell Prize, which is the sort of Nobel Prize for supercomputing last year. And uh, yeah, so ECP has you know, already started to show dividends and we're, we're very excited about what's coming next. All right, final thoughts. This is a very exciting time to be doing computational science. It's a terrifying time to be doing computational science. Um, it's very easy to just wanna opt out. I think it's really worth taking the time to understand what's happening with your codes, with codes you might wanna write, you know, on the hardware at all levels and the implications of how you use the hardware, um, I think you'll have a major advantage. I mean, even if you're just running VASP, I have, I'm predicting that at some point VASP is going to be designed such that it distributes across GPUs in a very specific way. And if you understand how that works and why it works, you will run VASP better than people who just sort of pick a recipe and, and follow it. Don't reinvent the wheel when it comes to computational stuff. Uh, use libraries you know, that are tried and true, that are, are designed for these new architectures. If you're an applied mathematician, invent, reinvent the wheel. <laughs> it, is, it is time to really re-examine everything we've been doing. Um, I think we have a lot of best practices cooked into codes that make no sense now. So I think there's a huge opportunity for 
early career researchers to you know, move the field forward just by the fact that they're not holding on to assumptions that you, know, you were trained on 30 years ago. So I'm, I'm making this a call to action. Please figure out how to do computational science better because that would make my life easier. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much.